today is a really exciting day. We have Ann Fellman on, who is the CMO, Chief Marketing Officer of Boomerang. And we talk with a lot of different folks from Boomerang, you know, off and on throughout the course of the year. Um, but this is a really interesting opportunity for us to kind of get an insider view to a major, major report that they just um, have conducted. And they're going to give us kind of an insider release to to some of this information. So, and we're really excited to get this. I mean, we're geeks here, and so anytime we get this information, this is just like what we live for. Again, everybody, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and the nonprofit nerd herself, Jared R. Ransom, I think is stuck in a snowstorm. She was actually in Utah. Uh, for part of the week. And um, so I think we will see her back hopefully tomorrow. We want to again thank all of our presenting sponsors from Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. These are our sponsoring partners who allow us to have these conversations. And it's really an interesting thing to note. Most of these people have been with us since day one, going back now three years, and they do not influence our editorial content. We never tell them what we're going to talk about. They don't, you know, push back or or anything. Sometimes they'll say, hey, this might be some an interesting guest, but it's really an amazing thing in media to have this relationship with these um, warriors in the nonprofit sector. As you have been hearing and seeing and witnessing, we're marching on towards our 700th episode, which I think occurs next week. And if you want to get any of our uh, back issues or our back episodes, you can find us on Roku, YouTube, Vimeo, and Amazon Fire TV. You can actually speak into your smart speaker or your smart remote if you have a smart TV and say the nonprofit show and we'll pop up. It's a little freaky. You got to try it. And if you like to consume your content on podcast, check us out. We're on several platforms there as well. Okay, Anne, whew, I got through my housekeeping. Now it's on to you, sister. Great. Well, Julia, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward to this um, this date for many months as we had planned. Um, so thank you so much uh, for inviting us onto the show. And to I'm really excited to give you a sneak peek on the on the study. This is literally, I got the report about a week ago into my hands. So wow. um, a lot, a lot to go through and a lot to dig into. So let's talk about how you conducted this report. This is not for the faint of heart to do these types of things. And I was telling uh, Anne in the green room, I think it's a really, from my perspective, Bloomerang does something really interesting is that they share their knowledge even with folks who aren't their clients and that is not traditionally done you know and so talk to us about like why you study and why you do this and then how you conducted this study well Julia thank you for that uh compliment um but at Bloomerang, one of the central components of our DNA as a company and what we believe our responsibility is for the sector is, one, of course, make great software that's easy to use, all that good stuff. That's one yeah. thing. But equally important is research, information, resources, templates, guides, anything that we can do to help an, a nonprofit organization, right? We have limited resources from a nonprofit perspective. We feel it's really important to lift up the entire sector, no matter what you're choosing, right? So we want to impart best practices, the research, the ideas, the insights to make and help all nonprofits thrive. Mm -hmm. Really important. So, so that is an overarching concept. And, and again, the, not everybody works this way. So you're starting out from a pretty unique perspective, how did you conduct this report and, and where did you secure this unbiased information? Great, yeah. So what we did is we've, in the past, we've partnered with a number of thought leaders and fundraising experts to do research. And so we partnered with the Institute for Sustainable Th Philanthropy. So you might know some names like Adrian Sargent, uh, Jen Shang, 
Catherine Edworthy, Harriet Jones Day. So we partnered with them to conduct the study. So it was really important to have object, you know, third party help us with the research, trying to understand what's really going on in the space and when, when it, as it relates to small and mid-sized nonprofits. Okay. Wow. That just like shoots this out of the park. Cause your credibility is like, that's amazing. That's a huge, huge thing to, um, commit to before even then going down this path. How long did this research take you? We could, we started with, you know, crafting the survey and ha having the conversations. We started conversations back in August. Mm -hmm. And then we said, we got to quickly get this in before all the, the giving season kicks off. Right. Cause we want to understand what, you know, the goal was around nonprofits and their attitudes and their sense of what's going on. You know, we talk a lot about the economy and what's going on. So we really wanted to understand for small and mid-sized nonprofits, which often they're not studied or researched to say, what are the perceptions? How are they, what are they thinking about? What are they feeling? What do they need? Risks, challenges, all those things. So we really wanted to tap into that. So that's where we partnered with the Institute for Sustainable Ph Philanthropy to design the survey. We fielded the survey in early November mm -hmm. and we received, we, the goal was to get uh, over a thousand respondents, which we did. Good. Um, mm -hmm. So that was fantastic in terms of the, the responsiveness, trying to understand really what was going on mm -hmm. in this space. Amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. So. You know, when you think about the data, a lot of times you might see research reports that are, you know, a couple hundred, which is great, right? Because it's useful data and insights, but a thousand, it's a pretty sizable population um, to kind of get some key takeaways from that standpoint. Well, let's start moving in that direction for key takeaways, because undoubtedly, I mean, unless you've been living in a cave, you, you can, it's easy to recognize that the past three years have been filled with tremendous change. An opportunity is born of change. I truly believe that, and I've seen that. But what has been a concern and, and where are we seeing maybe some opportunities for change? Should we change? I mean, what is everybody kind of thinking? Okay, well, there's a, there's a lot to unpack on this one. So let's start with the most obvious, right? And I, I wanna just, first start off by saying every organization we're in, you know, we're serving different um, sectors and different, you know, societal issues and things like that, that we're trying to make better. Right. So we all have a diff slightly different experience. So it might be, di you might, you know, for the, the listeners today, they might be having a little bit different experience. Love to hear about that. But um, in general, uh, a thousand uh, respondents across many different sectors in terms of, you know, what they're thinking, feeling, how they see 2023 and beyond. So the big one is obviously the economy mm -hmm. and recession, right? Mm -hmm. And what's going on there. And so what was really interesting was the, um, the thought process that, you know what, I think it's going to get a little better, right? The kind of the perception, you know what, there's always something difficult. So that really rang loud and true kind of commentary of, well, you know what, yeah, it's challenging and we are a little bit concerned with inflation and recession and thinking about our donors, mm -hmm. but we always have something difficult facing us when we're trying to fundraise. You know, dare I use the word optimism? I mean, were people being a little bit more optimistic? Well, so thank you. That's a perfect tie-in to okay. kind of data point number one, the fund rate, so small and mid-sized organizations, these are, you know, typically between one to two fundraisers, right, in, on on the on staff. Yeah. And they actually can, so one of the questions was, do you feel you're going to be able to hit your targets in 2023? Mm -hmm. So about 75%, so three quarters are saying, yes, I feel confident that I can hit my targets. And then we asked, how are you thinking? Can you, can you, can you beat your number? Can you exceed your targets? And that comes down a little bit more like half or about 55% are saying, yes, I feel confident that I can exceed my targets. So there's, we can hit plan, but maybe we won't be able to exceed the plan. Right. So a little bit measured in terms of the optimism and outlook on the uh, kind of related to that is 
internally too, right? There's a lot of uh, non, there's a lot of staff turnover and, yeah. and changes oh, yeah. and things like that can be a real drain, right? Can be really stressful and yeah. kind of damper our enthusiasm and optimism. And actually they're more optimistic about their organization getting better in the next 12 months, right? New leadership coming in, new people coming on to staff on staff. So yeah. it's interesting where they're mildly optimistic about the economy and the fundraising, but they're even just, they're a bit more optimistic about their organization and how their organization is doing. So it's kind of interesting to look at both how they're feeling internally, but also externally. So Anne, I got a man up to you. I would have not, I would have thought just the opposite. Same, same. Just the opposite. I am fascinated by that. I mean, actually I gotta say that makes me optimistic. You know, I mean, to have a thousand different you know, uh, folks across organizations across the sector, that is not what I expected for you to say. And you know, that's a, there's a common thread throughout this report, which is there's this kind of juxtaposition or there's, you know, we think one thing, but what then reality it's on the flip side. And so there's a little bit of this back and forth, um, happening, uh, from that standpoint. So it is, there's a few things where you're like, Oh, that's not what I thought would be the case. I got to ask you, um, your folks, and, and definitely what a, a, a pristine, uh, or uh, pristine's not the right word, but a, a, a really um, high level group conducting this research. Were they surprised by this? Yes, they oh, were. They were surprised right. by this. There are, there's a couple threads though to pull on of surprises. And some, some you will say, well, I've known that all along and we've been talking about that for ages. <laughs> Um, in terms of surprises or no surprises. One of the things um, that I was really surprised about was that uh, less than half of the organizations surveyed had a written down fundraising plan. What? I mean, is that so because of like COVID? Or, is that because of like COVID or is that just like, that's an operational thing? I think it's an operational thing, right? Yeah. If you think about how, pressed for time we are yeah right you yeah. know you kind of like yep yeah, we got to hit this number I'm going to go for it right and you just start doing your work right and get getting the job done um, but less than half that was really surprising to me so when I think about what is needed for strategic planning making sure that we have a good journey defined of how we're going to get to the outcomes for the organization that was that was a shocker um wow. yeah you know, um, as part and parcel to that, was that identified as a weakness or did they, did they understand that this is problematic or, you know, how does, how does that flow? Right. So great call out again, they recognize it. So a lot of the things where there's weaknesses yeah. or, Hey, this isn't going so well, I don't feel so great about, you know, this tactic or this approach, you know, how we're asking for donations in this capacity. There's a, then on the flip side, how they're thinking about 2023, they know they want to address it. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's good that they, we, you know, there's a recognition of these, these certain things need to improve. So that was one piece. I'm going to just throw out another shocker for you. Okay. I don't know if I can take it because I'm horrified of what kind of like what I've heard already. Yeah. Well, We've got work to do with our board. Oh, yeah. Boards, board involvement. So uh, respondents talked about 79% of the board gave or donated, participated in giving. Okay, we got, so not, our, our boards aren't giving. Wow. Now, there's quite a few that are, right? So how do we set those expectations for them? So that's one piece. Wow. And it, it, it's one thing to donate money from a board perspective, right? Board involvement, participation. It's another thing to be involved in fundraising activities. And this is the one that really shocked me was less than half of the board of, of, of our respondents said that their board was involved in fundraising activities, attending a gala, making an ask, writing that thank you note that first time, you know, the, the thank you note to the donor, making donor thank you calls, their, their board is not involved in fundraising activities. So that's, there's an opportunity for improvement there. And the fundraiser is frustrated by that. 
And that was a theme that came through was I need more support from a leadership perspective. Okay. That, I mean, we need to have you on for a whole nother episode just about that because um, one of the things that we're seeing, and I know you know this, is that we're seeing more and more uh, grant, you know, uh, applications and just partnership structures coming through pretty much saying if you don't have 100% financial participation with your board, we're not going to even look at you. And it, it can be like $1, $100, whatever the amount is. They're not even dictating what the amount is. They're just saying we need to have 100% financial participation. If we're off by 20%, that's frightening. Yeah, it's real impact. And that that oh. thread pulled through. Um, and then when you look at the fundraising mix as well, that's um, there's some really interesting pieces to unpack on that. So what is board involvement in leadership, right? Wow. I need, I need stronger leadership. There is this optimism. It sounds like maybe there's some leadership changes happening in a number of organizations. Cause that was one thing that they were optimistic and really excited about was the changes coming to their, their staff or their leadership. Right. Um, but definitely they've been disappointed with the involvement on that front. And do you think that this, I know, I know this is hard to kind of balance all this, but do you think that this is like a COVID issue um, that, oh, well, you know, they couldn't do it or we weren't out or we were somewhat closed down? Or do you just think that this has been a trajectory for board leadership without the pandemic, that this has just been a behavior that we've kind of, that we're dealing with? Well, yeah, I, I don't think it's necessarily related to COVID. I think it's more around setting expectations. And again, remember, we're, these are small and mid-sized nonprofits. So, so most of the organizations surveyed, more than half are you know, under $5 million in fundraising revenue, right. On a, right? So they're on the smaller side. And sometimes how the, the when, when an organization is just getting started out, right, who's on the board, right? It's your friends and family and other things, which is great, but it's also, we need to set expectations um, appropriately. And you know how, how you start to look at and think about your board. Boards are there to help you. Um, you know, even on, in the, on the corporate side, right? Ooh, the, the, the scary board meeting, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. We want boards that help organizations thrive. That's, what, that's their role. So we can all probably all do a better job asking our board, looking at the skills and talents that our board brings to the table and say, I wonder how I could use that a little bit better. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, so I would say that's kind of a hair and fire moment for me. Uh, and I'm not surprised, but I'm pretty disappointed uh, because 20% is a big, uh, you know, to get to 100% of board giving, shoot, that to, to move the needle 20% is Herculean. Yep. Um, what are some other things that you really noticed and, and sounds like you could be easily shocked and have a hair on fire moment too? <laughs> okay, oh, here's another one for you. Um, <laughs> there is a real concern about the aging of the nonprofit's donor population. Okay, yeah. Okay, all right. So that's probably a lot of us are like, yeah, I have that concern too. Mm -hmm. Now let's pair that with what's your fundraising mix? Well, how are, what kind of asks are you making? Are you making more, are you looking at how do we do more plan giving yeah. conversations? How do we look at bequests and legacy giving, right? Um, those are, those are flipped. So we're not doing that. So it may be that if it's, especially if it's a smaller organization that might not have a ton of experience there, doing those types of things. Yeah. Um, we gotta we gotta provide the resources and the support to, you know, help those that have never done that before, help them do that. Um, so that was really fascinating is just kind of how that is flipped from that standpoint. You know, that is a I love that you tagged this this aspect of the aging donor population to that other aspect because I think a lot of times we hear about concerns with an aging population and we immediately think uh, marketing and the digital connection like oh we still need to do in-person events we still need to send the letter with the envelope you know we we can't uh, navigate a digital relationship with these folks 
and that's just not enough going in the, you know, stopping there with that discussion. Very interesting. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Okay. So then in relationship to that conversation, was there any um, exploration of the digital component to this and people giving online and the frequency? I know this is like kind of a, a question from left field, but it just seems like it's a, a logical progression. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. So in 20, 2022, it was no surprise, like the primary way in which we were asking is through email appeals. But then again, on the flip side, it was the least successful in their mind. Um, one, when they also, when you think about donors, there was some comment, we, we had some open-ended where they could put in their comments and there was a big theme around aging donors. And then also then, okay, we need to do a better job on major gifts. I need to do a better job also asking the, for younger donors, mm -hmm. um, and, and those different platforms. So there's a willingness to go experiment and they realize that they want to go experiment on those, those new platforms, peer to peer, mm -hmm. um, social media fundraising, right? Those types of things. So they're ready and they're going to put some additional energy into it. Although this year it didn't perform to what they need. So there is a recognition of that. Hey, this didn't go so well. I'm going to put a little bit more energy into this channel or this technique of fundraising. So that's good. As opposed to just abandoning it. Right. Right. Recognizing that they can invest more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one thing though that I really want to call out because I I talk about I think about this and talk about this from um, when we were in COVID corporate giving okay so it's about five percent of the overall you know if you look at FEP and giving right. USA it's about the big pie right yeah it's about five percent <laughs> right corporate giving in terms of um, the small and mid-sized nonprofits that we surveyed, they're two times that amount that they go get money from corporations or they, they that as part of their mix. I'm going to caution on that because, so in COVID, corporate giving pulled back, right? Companies started to batten down the hatches and say, we need to lower our expenses. We need to tighten up. So we're going to be a little bit less generous. They started to open up post I guess in 2021, they started to open up a little bit more now with this recession. And when you look at what's going on in the technology sector with big technology companies are doing layoffs and things like that, I would ask that you look hard at if you're pursuing a corporate giving, who are those organizations and what are they facing from an economic outlook? If you can do the research and maybe rebalance your mix a little bit. You know, and that almost leads me back to the very first thing that you said, the very first hair on fire moment for me was not having a, a fundraising plan. Um, that might be somewhat of a shock to some of these organizations who don't, who haven't really thought, forecasted or operate around that notion of what the percentage will be. Because mm -hmm. then that sets you up for some pretty catastrophic failure if you're like, oh, 50% of our, you know, our fundraising is going to go through corporate partnerships when the reality is the national average five, seven, if you're really, really lucky. Right. No. Right. So that's, again, that some of these kind of competing thoughts or priorities of what we think versus what's really going on in the space that we do need to take a step back. Um, also, you have to keep in mind too, with small organiz smaller organizations, it's, you know, lean from a staffing one person. Yeah. Right. One or two people. And then also when they um, look at their fundraising mix, it's usually one or two kind of core veins of fundraising. Uh, and so it's not surprising, but I would just say if corporate giving or some what are some of these other areas, take a good hard look. I always like to talk about your fund. You just like a um, fundraising mix, just like you have an investment portfolio. Right. Yes. I love that you said that. Balance that. Yeah, I love that you said that. Okay, so we don't have much time left and I could spend hours with you on this. And I do think we need to have you back and, and maybe drill down on some even more specific things. But what are the opportunities? I mean, coming ahead, looking forward, um, that, that people are actually optimistic. To me, that opens the door towards opportunity. What are you seeing or what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Right. 
Um, so one, yes, th- take a step back. Mm-hmm. I think give your give yourself some grace. <laughs> give yourself a moment to think. We we are so busy and so time con- c- compressed. I always talk about. So I always say you got to slow down to speed up. And I like that, yeah. yeah. So That's making nice. sure that we slow down, get that plan on a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we can go faster. So that's one piece. I think the other piece that is lacking a little bit. Okay. So we talked about the board involvement yeah. and leadership, like executive director involvement and fundraising. But as you think about your, your organization and philanthropy as a core value, mm-hmm. and that was another piece that there was only about half of the respondents said that philanthropy was like central to their core, you know, to, to one of their values. Right. Yeah. Um, I always talk about it. It's like, it's people it, at the end of the day, it's all about people, but it's, you know, we power, they power our missions through time and dollars. Yes. Right. Yes. Wow. So, so I think it comes down to people, it's relationships, making sure we have philanthropy that we're comfortable making the ask or get more comfortable telling a story. Mm-hmm to make the ask. So philanthropy has a core value. And then I think we need to lean hard into our boards yeah. and our leadership team and set expectations. And if we, again, take that time to make that plan, mm-hmm. right? And that strategy, what are the overarching themes? What are the overarching directions we should be shifting? If our donor population is aging, we should be thinking about these things, having those those types of conversations and making the ask of our boards, yeah. of our leadership team to help us a little bit more um, and that, I think the last, the kind of the last two components of this is also there's a, a reluctance to invest in fundraising from a resources or dollars perspective. So we need to make sure that we are, it's strategically funding fundraising, right? How do I run a campaign or a program if I don't have any program dollars to print whatever it is that I want to print? Um, those types of things. So again, back to that plan, the plan is central, culture is central, leadership is central to helping us hit these milestones. So it's, you know, making sure we've got dollars to run our programs because long-term, I know it's, we are trying to minimize expense, but having the opportunity to invest a little bit in our fundraising programs. You know, it's so interesting. Um, when you just, when we first started, it seemed like so many of these topics are standalone topics. And in 30 minutes, it's been riveting to see how they all are intertwined and so interdependent. Um, one begets the other. I mean, it, it really is something that to your point, you've got to step back, take a bigger picture, look at it, and then, uh, you know, move forward because Wow, lots to unpack. Before I let you go, how are we going to be able to get this information? I mean, this is probably one of the first uh, public times you've been speaking about this. When will this be available so that we can, you know, drill down more ourselves? Well, the team is act. The team at Bloomerang we're actively digesting this report. It's uh, right now. It's a uh, thirty-six pages, and it's it's pretty in-depth, intense. I mean. Julia, we could talk for hours about this. Yeah. So what I would say is go to bloomerang.com and we have, um, if you look on our top level nav, there's a thing called uh, uh, resources articles. That's our blog. Sign up for our blog. That's a great way. One, we have lots of great articles you do. on a lot of the topics we just talked about, mm-hmm. but that'll be the best way. If you're not familiar with Bloomerang, sign up for our blog digest. Um, and that way we'll keep you informed as to what's going on um, and I when we publish a report. You know, let's get you back on um, and I'm going to publicly shame you into making a commitment. <laughs> of course. Let's, let's I'm get, committed. Yeah, let's get you back on to talk about that board component because I think that is a, an amazing opportunity, but it's frightening to think that there's some uh, problems with that because ultimately without the support of our boards, we can't navigate forward the way we want to. Ann Feldman, wow. A warrior woman, she's got a four-year-old. She just traveled in from Canada. She's in a major, major epic snowstorm. You know it's bad, Anne, when they name the snowstorms. 
which I think they have. I think that's new. <laughs> I think it is too. It's horrific. Um, but wow. And then it's the holidays. So you're a warrior, my friend, for coming on and really giving us a sneak peek. It's really been fun. Ann Feldman, Chief Marketing Officer for Bloomerang. Um, we love the Bloomerang product. Um, I know Jarrett Ransom loves it as well. She has worked with a lot of her clients in this, this uh, with this technology and has nothing but amazing things to say about it. So um, check out Bloomerang. It's a really interesting process. And I do get your blog posts, your, your communications. I always learn something new and it's, you're not just pushing your product. It's you're, you're pushing our industry, I think is what I, how I would define it. So check out uh, Bloomerang's work. It really is something that uh, I think you can r really help everyone. Really quickly, um, AFP Icon coming up in 2023, New Orleans, April 16th through 18th. If I'm not mistaken, we're going to be broadcasting episodes of the nonprofit show from your booth. Yes, we will be there. Julia, this has been fabulous. So thank you so much for the opportunity. We're here to help all nonprofits thrive and appreciate the partnership. Well, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we will, you'll hear more and more from us. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. Jarrett Ransom will be joining us back tomorrow. Again, we want to thank all of our partners. Um, who are with us day in and day out on this journey. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and The Nonprofit Nerd. And you've really got my mind just whirling. It's been really fun to, to have this time with you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Hey, everybody, as we like to end every episode of The Nonprofit Show, we want to leave you with this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone, and stay warm. You too. You too. <laughs>